People are always really, really surprised by how big the shroud is. Now, we're going to have this beautiful replica installed, so people will see for themselves. But it's big. It's 14 feet long and three and a half feet wide. So I want you to be able to see that her body shape is evident when you wrap her up like this. So we can see that she's got her nose is right here. We can see her fingers coming through the fabric. We can see her toes right here. So we can clearly see that the fabric drapes over her body. So then the other thing I like to talk about when I'm folding it up is that during its history, the shroud was stored folded up many different ways. The shroud was folded up and it was in a silver reliquary in an altar and the church caught on fire. And the silver reliquary box that the shroud was stored in started to melt. And a piece of that molten silver is what dropped down into a corner of the shroud. And that's why when you open it up, we have this repeating pattern of these triangle shapes where those burn holes were. All right, so we are going to start. This is the slide I usually start with to show how the shroud wrapped the body of the man of the shroud. And so now you've seen how the body is on the inside and the image is a head-to-head -head image. And that's where this handout is really helpful. And we're going to have this in the exhibit. It's going to be in front of the shroud replica mm -hmm. so that people can orient themselves. When they're looking at the shroud replica, they can say, oh, that's, that's his face. That's the back of his head. And they can understand how it's a head-to-head -head image on the inside of the fabric. I like to orient people to, this is a, a, the shroud cut in half. So here's the face of the man of the shroud. So this is the front image, and this is the back image. And the thing that you see most evidently are those patches from those burn marks that we talked about. So these triangular shaped patches are repeated throughout the shroud. There's also water stains. There's a very prevalent one here, and then it's repeated here, and then it's repeated a little less here and a little less here. So that's one of those water stains from when the shroud was folded up at one time in its past. It also has water stains on it that they think could have been from when the water was put on the shroud as a result of that fire. So different kinds of water stains. There is blood on the shroud, all over the shroud in fact. Some of the most prominent blood stains are at the forehead, there's that famous epsilon or backwards E shaped blood stain. There's the blood trailing down the arms at the wrists. There's a lot of blood stains at the back of the head and the back and then trailing across the small of the back from this chest wound and then down the back of the legs and then a big bloody footprint at the back of the left foot. So those are the blood stains and we're going to talk in more depth about the, each of these markings. But I just wanted you to be oriented to what you're looking at. And then, of course, the last thing is this very faint image of a man. And the man has been scourged. He's been capped with thorns. He's been pierced in the side, and he's been crucified. So all of the wounds of the crucifixion are depicted on there. So we're going to start with talking about the, the linen itself. So this is a close-up of the shroud fabric. So the shroud is made of a linen fabric. So linen is an, an organic product. It's made from flax. <clears throat> and our replica that we're having here in our exhibit is very special because it is made from flax that was grown in a field in Bergamo, Italy in 2020. And they took the seeds for this flax from the International Seed Vault, and then they grew this heirloom flax seed in this field in Bergamo, Italy. And then once it was grown, they, they harvested it, and then they spun it into thread, and then they wove the thread into the linen fabric using first century methods. So we're calling this old linen. And then on top of this beautiful old linen, they have printed using a high definition laser printer an exact replica of what the shroud looks like. So the replica that we're going to have here in our exhibit is going to look as close to the actual shroud as possible. And they only made seven of these. 
So there was only enough flax that grew to produce seven of these re reproductions. So it was gifted to the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston from the Archdiocese of Turin. So it's very special that we have it here. And it's, it's just a real tremendous honor that we're gonna have that replica in this exhibit. That's going to be the centerpiece of so the exhibit. So what was the connection between Houston and Turin? So, Why did they choose this one? Over yeah, so over all the options. So right. the we started working on this exhibit in, I think it was in January or February of 2019. And we started writing letters because you have to have the, the head of the diocese request the the copy and so I wrote a letter for Cardinal Donardo's signature and I think it was put in he signed it maybe in March of 2019 and all of this time went by of course COVID happened I moved to California all this time went by and we never got our replica and we were planning to pay for it and it was just going to be an ordinary replica on ordinary cotton and so all this time went by I had gotten pretty frustrated and I finally sent a text to Father Dalton, who you all know by now. And I said, Father Dalton, I'm just gonna give up and I'm gonna buy a shroud off of eBay. And he said, okay, hold on, give me, give me some time and I'll see what I can do. So on the next Sunday morning, and this was the last year, so it was around Easter, it was during Lent, about a year ago, and I got a text on Sunday morning from Enrico Seminato, who's the caretaker of the Shroud in Turin. And it was kind of a mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa, because the, the Cardinal is the one who'd asked for this, and it hadn't been sent to us. And I think there was some recognition that we need to send these people a really great replica. So he said, thank you so much for your patience, and we're gonna send you this replica. And not only is it what you've asked for, but it's a super special one. Hi, Lydia, welcome and we're sending it to you for free. So that's how it happened, yeah. So it was, in fact, um, I've written, I think it's gonna be in the exhibit, it's called The Journey of the Shroud, which gives that background about being frustrated and uh, almost giving up hope, but all during that time of COVID, that's when this flax was growing. And really the message is the Holy Spirit had a better plan yeah. for this exhibit than than what I was thinking all along. So it's really, it's a good story. Mm -hmm. it Did you have a question? What, do we know where the other six copies yeah. went? I know okay. you said they went, one went to Washington, D.C. Yes, there's one in Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. and it's actually going to be put on display at the Catholic Information Center because it was at the Museum of the Bible in a temporary exhibit. And it's going to be on temporary display at the Catholic Information Center and we're announcing that at the National Catholic Prayer Breakfast next Tuesday. So that opens on March 28th, and it's gonna be on temporary display there. Hopefully it will find a permanent home in Washington, D.C. So that's one. I know one went to Poland. I know there's one in Mexico. I think there's one in Rome, and one maybe in Turin. And the other two I would have to check my notes for. But they're all over the world. But we, we've got one of them. So until there's more of this flax grown, that's all there is. So, okay, so Lydia, did you get the handouts? Okay, great. Gloria. Could you go back about the seeds, the flax seeds? They were grown, they were taken from the International Seed Vault, which is in Sweden. And that's where they have heirloom seeds are protected there in case there's a nuclear holocaust. That there is a way to go and gather these heirloom seeds and reproduce the crops in the world. And what is an heirloom seed? Like the old ones, not not genetically modified. Oh, okay. okay. So like an original seed. Okay. So yes. uh, now that they have grown some from these ancient seeds, they will be collecting seeds again from that? I think their plan is to grow more, but I don't know the status of that right now. Okay. As far as I know, there's not any more of the fabric. So I'm not sure of the status if they're planning to do more of that or not. Okay. Mary Jane. Are, are all of these seven certified copies of the Shroud? Yes, they all came from awesome. the, the International Center for Shroud Studies okay. in Turin. Okay. So the original Shroud is made of this 
flax that's woven into linen. And the weave of the shroud is called a herringbone weave. And it's called that because it's three strands of thread over one. The linen is woven from flax. So the, the flax is grown and then it's harvested and it's treated. And I'm actually gonna send you all a video that talks about the treatment process for the flax because people are interested in that. It's, a, it's an interesting topic. So one of the ways that they know the shroud is ancient is the way that they treated the, the hanks of the fabric, the strands. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you buy yarn, it's in a hank. So those hanks, when they were treated, each one is different. So in the ancient fabrics, there's banding that you can see from when this hank was treated and that hank was treated. That's one of the ways they can test the authenticity of the shroud is these bands of color. The shroud is made of linen, which was a common material in the first century. Lots of things were made of woven linen, but typically it was a one over one weave because that was very simple to do. Set up your loom and do a one, one to one weave. This shroud, the, the ancient shroud, was a herringbone weave. So it had three strands in the, the up and down portion, the warp. And then the weft would go through, go over three, under one, over three, under one. And so it made this twill. And the thing that we have today that's most like that is your Levi's jeans. They are a, a twill, that same three over one pattern. So, that's what made this linen very precious because it was, it was more difficult to manufacture. And so even though linen was common, having it manufactured in this way was more precious. So it was a more expensive piece of fabric than the normal fabric. There's our ear. Okay. Do we know why they chose such a, an expensive fabric to so that's a theological question. So the answer to that is you, for the Jewish people, they buried their dead in a clean, which means ritually pure, linen cloth. And for it to be ritually pure, that means it had to be on a loom that wasn't used for wool. So the linen, the priests wore a linen garment when they did their their rights as the priest. And so theologically, this is important that Jesus is doing his atoning sacrifice dressed as a priest in a ritually pure linen garment. So that's a theological question. Yes, Rob. Another question, isn't the tomb that he was buried in to belong to a rich man? Yes, so and it was so the- So maybe the cloth had been there already because the guy was rich. Well, the Gospels tell us that Joseph of Arimathea, who is the one who requested Jesus' body, was a rich man, and that he put Jesus in a tomb that had been designed for him. Yeah. It was a brand new tomb, had never been used before. And the Gospels also tell us that he bought this, this linen fabric for his burial. So those are all very significant in the Gospels, significant points for, for the burial. Okay, the other thing that's interesting, I don't know if you'll ever get a question about this, but the size of the fabric, I told you it's about 14 feet long and it's about three feet wide. Now I say about because A, it's linen, and if you've ever had linen, you know in humid, humid climates it stretches and then it, con it contracts. And then also there was a restoration done on the fabric in 2002 and so it was stretched after that restoration to get rid of some of the wrinkles and creases. So the size has been different at different points in time. But it relates to the cubit, which was the measurement used in Syria for measuring things. And it relates, the size relates to two cubits by eight cubits. And so that's consistent with first century technology of, of how things would have been measured in the first century. This is a really great resource for you to keep in front of you. You can see that the image is very faint. And the closer you get to the image when you're actually in front of it, the more difficult it is to see. You actually, it's kind of like a, one of those 
paintings, the pointillist paintings, yeah. where when you get close up to it, you can't really make it out, but when you step back, you can see it better. So there's a lot of things about the image which are very unique. So one of them is that there's no outline. So in a painting, you have an edge to the, to the painting, but the shroud, there's no outline. There's no shadows. So there's no, like in a photograph, if you take a, a photo, you'll have shadows where the light is blocked. There's no shading or shadows on the shroud image. The image is only about 15% darker than the surrounding fabric. So it's very, very faint. So it's not that easy to see. And there's linen strands that are right next to other linen strands some have the image and some don't have the image. So let me back up and explain <clears throat> that we talked about the, the threads that make up the linen fabric. So each one of those threads is made up of fibrils. So one thread has between 120 and 200 fibrils. And that's why I have this slide in here so that you can see. This is one thread, this is the thread, and then you can see all of those hairy things are the fibrils. And so each thread has about 120 to 200 fibrils. And the reason why this is important is because the image is only on maybe two to 10 of those fibrils on each thread. So that's how superficial the image is. It's two nanometers, which I don't even, I can't even comprehend how little that is. So the best description I've heard is if you take one of your hairs and you divide it in half, and then you divide it in half again, the image is that superficial, two nanometers. So it's only in the, a few of the fibrils of each thread. And then the other interesting thing is that the image doesn't even penetrate the cell wall of those fibrils. It's only on the outside of those fibrils. So it's completely superficial. It doesn't soak through the fabric at all. It's, it's sitting just on the very topmost portion. And this image I put in here, so they untwisted some of the, the warp threads or the weft threads going over the warp threads. So you can see that this, whoops, I'm sorry. This thread has colored areas, but then it also has clear areas. So there's thread fibrils right next to other fibrils. Some have image, some don't. And it's completely superficial. So one of the best descriptions I've heard, and I think this is from Father Dalton, if you took a razor blade, and you scraped it across the surface of the image area, you could completely remove the image. It's that superficial. Um, yes? One thing in the video, or the podcast, where mm -hmm. we talked about how they, by the corners, so you get in it later with the patching mm -hmm. of it and stuff, mm -hmm. where they took the samples. Yes. Anyway, uh, that they carried it around on display and stuff, and my thought was, as superficial as the image is, I think, how much of that image was lost by rubbing it by things or folding it and unfolding it. Well, that's one of the mysteries because the it's been <coughs> exposed to fire, so it's been exposed to this extreme heat. It's been doused with water, but yet the image remains. Yeah. So the image, what the scientists discovered in 1978 when they did the STIRP studies is that the image area is actually a chemical change in the fibers. So the <coughs> it's a, they call it a dehydration of the cellulose wall of the fibrils. So it's basically a rapid aging. So the image area, only those tiny little fibers have rapidly aged and that's why they're a darker color. Oh. So as the linen ages, theoretically it should catch up in age to the fabric itself. So is, is that clear what I just yeah. said? Because that's an important point that what scientists believe caused the image is rapid dehydration of the cellulose of the, the fibers. So the outside of the fibers age more rapidly than the non-image areas. So another thing that's a mystery is that the density of the image is consistent. So whether it's the front 
of the man's body or the back of the man's body, it doesn't matter. There, the weight of the man's body doesn't change the density of the image. It's consistent across the whole fabric. So for example, a painter, if a painter painted ha harder in one area and softer in another area, you'd have a different density. But on the shroud, it's completely the same wherever they measure the density of the image. <clears throat> so some areas are darker, but they're only darker because more fibrils are colored. So if you imagine one of those magic markers with, that has the round dot at the end, and if you put a dot on a piece of paper here, and you put a dot on a piece of paper here, and you put a dot here, you'd have the same density, but if you started putting a lot of dots in one area, it would start to look darker. So each one of those dots is the same density, but more dots makes it look darker. And that's exactly what's happened on the shroud. Each one of the places where the fibers have changed colors, it's the same, but there's more fibers colored in some of the areas that appear darker. Mm -hmm. So I'll show you some more pictures if that's not clear. What's the color? They used to do that in newspapers. You know, the, the pictures, huh. the lighter was less dots, the yes. darker was more on the black and white. Same idea. Yeah. What was the cause of the rapid dehydration? Well, that's one of the theories about how the image was formed. So again, probably a theological question because the theories are, the theories that are most prevalent today about what caused the image is a rapid burst of non-hot radiant energy. So ultraviolet energy coming from the body itself. So you, you can see why that's a theological question, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the light of the resurrection is a theory about how the image was created. And so I, I think that's gonna be something you'll have to navigate here because you're in a secular space and you're going to have people coming who may not be Christian or may have a different belief system. And so the We'll have to make sure that we're careful in terms of how we word that, uh, about that. But that is the most prevalent theory, is that a source of light came from the body. It was a low heat, high intensity radiation that caused this rapid dehydration of the image area. Okay, so I put this one here so that you could get the idea. Mm -hmm. So you can really see those fibrils here. And you can see how there's some fibrils that are colored and some that are not colored. And this is a 35 millimeter transparency and it's 64 magnification and it's at the tip of the nose. So that is one of the most dark areas on the shroud. And so you can see not all of the fibrils are, are discolored, even in that area where it's very dark. How much was the magnification? This one was 64. Okay, so that's all I have on the image. So I'm going to move on to the blood unless there's other questions about the image. Because these are kind of like the crucial questions I think you might get. The blood is very interesting to people. And of course there is blood all over the shroud. And one of the questions I always get is, is there DNA on the shroud? And the answer is yes, there is DNA all over the shroud because everybody that's handled it has left a trace of themselves on there. There is blood on the shroud. It's been determined that it is, uh, contains hemoglobin and it gives a positive test for serum albumin, which is a protein that's found in blood. And up until about a year ago, I always said in my presentations that the blood is AB blood. And it is AB blood. It's been tested and shown to be AB blood. But the reason why I haven't, I've not been including that in my presentations is because there's new studies that show that all old blood becomes AB blood. So this is, and I imagine you'll get a question about this because the Eucharistic miracles are all AB blood type. <coughs> And so further study needs to be done on this issue about was that the blood type of 
the blood originally? Did it become AB over time? Would you like to shut that? So Did you call it serum what? It's serum albumin. Albumin. Yes, so that's a protein that's found in blood. <clears throat> now, I also used to always say that it's human, male human blood, but there's some people that are calling that into question now also. Hmm. So the bottom line about the blood is that more testing needs to be done. Hmm. The blood is very degraded and there aren't complete strands of DNA. So with current technology, there's no way to clone Jesus from the blood that's on the shroud. That is a question I almost always get. So, the other thing about the shroud blood that's very interesting is that it has retained its bright red color. So this is not a touched up um, picture. It still has that very bright red color, just like it was recently shed. And this has been one of the mysteries of the shroud. Why does it retain its bright red color? Because we all know that after a little bit of time, blood exposed to air turns brown and then black. But this blood hasn't done that. So there was a study that was done in 2017 that showed that when a person had experienced a poly trauma, so had been tortured and had experienced a lot of trauma, that there were high levels of bilirubin that were put into the blood and then also high levels of creatinine. And so this combination of bilirubin and creatinine changes the blood chemistry and it retains its bright red color. Hmm. So this is just news in 2017. So some of the ongoing studies about the shroud. When Barry comes, so Barry Schwartz will be here in April, and he was the documenting photographer for the CERT team, <clears throat> And he says that this was one of the reasons why he didn't believe in the authenticity of the shroud initially, because he said, how does that blood stay bright red? It's got to be some artist's rendition or something. So it wasn't until these t studies of the blood came out that showed that people who've experienced trauma, their blood stays <coughs> red. Is Billy Rubin, what else? Creatinine. Yeah. Creatinine. Yeah. Another interesting thing about the blood that I think you should be sure to mention is that the blood was on the shroud first. Okay. So the image was on the shroud afterwards. And the way scientists know that is when they look underneath the blood, there's no image on there. So the blood was on there first. So that's a very interesting thing. A third thing that's very interesting is that scientists are able to tell the difference between venous blood and arterial blood. And you can see that on this head wound here. So this epsilon or backwards three, that's venous blood. And the way that the researchers know that is because it made a slow path. So it hit the wrinkles in the forehead and then made a slow path down the forehead. So it, it wasn't under pressure. So arterial blood is under pressure. And so some of the blood at the, the top of the head is more like dispersed. So it's not flowing down gradually, it's more pumped out. And so they're able to tell a difference from that. Okay, so that's, oh, the third thing about the blood or an additional thing about the blood is it soaks through the entire fabric. So it has that capillary action that you would expect from a fluid where the fabric soaks it up and it draws it up into the fabric. The image area has no capillary action. It's only in those very superficial fibrils. It doesn't pass through the fabric, but the blood is visible on the other side of the fabric as well. It soaks through as you would expect blood to flow through. So the next thing we have is the Man of the Shroud. So this is an artist's reproduction of what the Man of the Shroud looked like. And some of the most notable things about him, they've been able to calculate his size. So he was between 5'10 and 6 feet tall, and somewhere between 170 and 180 pounds. And he was muscular and well-built. Now, a question I often get is, wow, doesn't that seem really big for somebody from the first century? And it 
is within the range of other skeletons that have been excavated in the area around Jerusalem from the first century. On the tall side, but not a total outlier. So people in the Middle, middle Ages in Europe, they were smaller than this. But the Jewish people around Palestine around the first century, this size person is in the range of other skeletons that have been found. So it's not an outlier. Do we know how tall St. Peter was when we found his tomb? I don't know. That's a good question because they found his bones. Yeah, we yeah. found his tomb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's a good question. One of the ways forensic doctors have looked at the, the shroud and they've been able to determine that it's anatomically perfect. And one of the ways that they have measured that is that there's relationships between the leg bones. So the, the distance from the hip to the knee and the knee to the ankle, those are ratios that are, are typical in different groups of people. And the man of the shroud, the ratio between his bones is typical for a, a Jewish person of the first century. So it's been shown that it's anatomically correct in all of these different kind of measurements. The, the features of his face are typical Jewish male features. He has the almond-shaped eyes. He has a long nose. He wears a full beard. And you can see in this recreation that there's hairs have been plucked out of the center of this beard. And so this is a fulfillment of Isaiah, which says that, that they will pluck out my beard when Isaiah is talking about the suffering servant. And you can see that on the shroud. Why would they do that? In part of the mocking, when Jesus is being held by the, I believe it's the Jewish, Soldiers, they pluck out his beard as uh, torture. I've heard a scholar who's a, an expert on Jewish, first century Jewish people, and she says the most Jewish thing about the man of the shroud is his unbound ponytail, and that this would be the hairstyle of a rabbi in the first century to, to wear a pigtail in the back. And then today we still see the Jewish men with those forelocks in the front with the, the Hasidic men wear those forelocks. So how did you get the shape of the ponytail that was on It's the shape is still there, but it's not there's nothing binding it. So this is what the shroud looks like to the naked eye, this image right here. So a lot of times on the early icons of Jesus, they have those kind of big owl-shaped eyes almost that, because that's how it looks to the naked eye with that, those big oval sockets here. And as I already explained, it's because the distance from the sockets to the fabric were, it was greater. I'll go back and I'll explain that more. I just, I'm skipping ahead because I wanted to show you one feature here. And that is that there are no ears on the shroud. And so there's some theories about why there's no ears. One theory is that there was a chin strap. So that the chin strap was put on to keep the mouth shut. So after rigor mortis relaxed, then the mouth wouldn't drop open. And so that's one thought is that that shadow that you see here is from the chin strap. The other thought is, goes back to Gloria's question about how the image was formed. One of the theories is that when the body became a spiritual body, that the fabric dropped down kind of through the body as it was kind of dematerializing. And the image only it creates four centimeters of depth. And I'm gonna explain that more in just a minute. But the thought is that it was, by the time it got to the ears, the the body was gone, and so that's why there's no ears left on the image. It's a theory. So I'm gonna explain that more. But I just wanted to stop and talk about that chin strap for a second, because we're here at a funeral museum, and I believe the plan is to have an exhibit on Jewish burials next to the shroud exhibit. And so this, uh, having this chin strap would have been something that would have been a normal part of the burial process. Yes? 
I was listening to a podcast by Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers, and he said the other thing with the eyes is to keep the keep the eyes closed that they put coins. Yes. And so that gives that kind of round appearance as well. Um, and he also made note, because it's from the Marian Fathers of the Divine Mercy, that the Divine Mercy image from Th Sister Faustina that she originally um, produced is um, fits superimposed right over this image and it's, it's, it's exactly the same. Yes, those are both good points. Thank you for bringing that up. I didn't mention about the coins, but we have coins that are going to be in our exhibit. And there's actually in this book, there is a whole page here on the coins. Let's see, page 17. There's a whole page here about the coins. And I do not cover this in my presentations because it's somewhat controversial. So I'm gonna tell you that there is something over his eyes. But whether it's coins or just pieces of glass is up for debate. Now there are some people who say that it is has been proven to be a lepton that was minted under Julius Caesar, or is that what it says? One of the Caesars that would have been during the first century, Tiberius Caesar. So, but other people say there's a, a it's called paradoi, paradola, where you see what you want to see. And so like if you're looking at a cloud and you see, oh, I see a horse jumping over a rainbow. Like you can see what you put in your mind to see. So this is not settled that these are coins from the first century. It's very likely that they are coins of some type or else pieces of glass or ceramics or something. But that is a part of the burial custom is to put something over the eyes so that the eyes stay closed. And we do have coins that are gonna be in our exhibit and Genevieve and I've gone back and forth about this, about whether how how the wording is going to be uh, about it so once the exhibits develop then we'll do the training on exactly what's in there but i know that rudy who donated his items to us he had some coins in his artifacts that he donated to us so i haven't seen how that's going to shape up yet the other thing you mentioned about the um, saint faustina and the divine mercy image that is also very interesting, and I'm actually hoping to have a work with somebody to de develop a lecture about that, because that whole Divine Mercy image is very fascinating, and its relationship to the shroud. This illustrates this idea that there's a relationship between the distance of the cloth from the body and the image density. So we talked about when we wrapped up Deborah that you could see that her nose was, you could see her nose through the outline of the fabric. And so the nose is one of the darkest areas on shroud because it was actually touching the fabric. But there's image in areas that weren't touching the fabrics, like here at the neck, at the Adam's apple. There's image there even though the fabric wasn't touching that. So this kind of eliminates the idea that this could be a rubbing, like, you know, when you trace something with a marker, because it has to be touching it. So the area of the, the neck, there's image, but it's more faint than like areas that were touching the fabric. So what these researchers discovered is that there was a relationship between the distance from the cloth to the body, and that that distance could be mapped, and they could turn it into three-dimensional uh, rendering. So this is what I was trying to explain before. We talked about that the image is only two nanometers thick, so less than the thickness of a human hair, but yet they can get four centimeters of information about the man from just that tiny superficial image. It kind of blows your mind, really. There's no other image in the world that has this quality. So they can construct a three-dimensional figure of the man of the shroud from this 
uh, image analyzer, which is called a VPA image analyzer. So it's an analog machine that they used back in the 1970s. And it was developed because it was being used to take photographs that were just black and white and changing the, the light and dark shades from color to depth to amplitude. And so the scientists took a photograph of the shroud and put it into this image analyzer machine, and this green picture is what came out. So they were absolutely amazed <clears throat> that there was, it came out as a looking like a person with three-dimensional information. So they discovered that there was three-dimensional information encoded in the shroud itself. The history of the shroud from 1355 until today is completely well documented. No question at all about the history starting in 1355. So the first time the shroud shows up in recorded history, we know that it's owned by a family in Lire, France, and they are putting it on display somewhere in the 1340s. So Lire, France is way up here. <laughs> And that's the first place it shows up in recorded history. And it's owned by a woman, and I'm gonna get her name right this time. Her name is Jean de Bergy, and I'm probably not saying that correctly, but she was a French woman, and she was the widow of a French knight named Geoffrey de Charny. Jean de Bergy and uh, Robert de Charny married each other, and they had a commemorative medal struck for everybody that came to their wedding and it had the coat of arms of Jean on one side and the coat of arms of Robert on the other side and the shroud in between. So it, it showed that their families had owned the shroud at the time that they got married. 1348, this um, badge. So it's their, shows their different coats of arms and um, so we know that the shroud was in that area of France going back to the 1340s. But the reason why I say the first time it shows up in written history in 1355 is because the Descharnies were putting the shroud on display and pilgrims were coming to see it. And the bishop at the diocese next to them registered a complaint. And so that's the first time it was written down. And that bishop registered a complaint because the pilgrims were going to the next diocese and not coming to his diocese. <laughs> so he registered a complaint and said, they're showing something that's not approved. And so they were chastised and said, you can't display it anymore. So they stopped displaying it for a while. So time passed and their granddaughter, whose name was Margaret de Charny, inherited the shroud and this was during the time in Europe when the Hundred Years' War was going on. And so Margaret wanted to have security for the shroud. She wanted to make sure it was in safe hands. So she made an agreement with the ruling family of that area, which was the Savoy family. So Margaret traded the shroud for two castles. And she was subsequently excommunicated from the Catholic Church for this. But it became the property of the Savoy family in 1453. So it transferred from Margaret de Charny to the Savoy family. So all of this is well documented, not disputed at all. So I'm just going to quickly go through the history from there to here. Lydia. So Jean de Vergy was prior to... She was... Margaret was Jean de Vergy's granddaughter. <laughs> Anyway, Which is, it was in France, right? Yes, it was in France. It was owned by this family. And the most important thing about this is that family would never say how they came to own the shroud. So they were putting it on display. The pilgrims were coming to see it. They were saying it was the authentic burial cloth of Jesus, but they would never admit how they came to own it. So that is an important point we'll come back to. Gloria. So you don't know how it got from Jerusalem to... There's theories about that. <clears throat> so that's why I'm saying this part from 1355 forward is settled. Before 1355, a lot of people have a lot of ideas. So I'm going to give you maybe the most widely agreed upon theory about what happened. So Jesus died in Jerusalem 
in 33, and Peter and John found the linen in the tomb. It tells us that in the Gospel of John. But it never tells us in the scriptures what happened to it, and it never is mentioned again. There's never an image in scripture mentioned on one of these linen, linen cloths. There's some hints in scripture that maybe are referring to the shroud. But there is something called the discipline of the secret, and it's because the, the Christians were <coughs> under persecution almost from the very beginning. And so they had to they had to keep secret and they had to just tell things in code. So that's why they had the fish symbol, because that that would be a symbol that the the oppressors wouldn't recognize. So there was this discipline of the secret. The other thing is that for a Jewish person to come in contact with a corpse or to come in contact with blood would make them impure. And so they had to go through a ritual cleansing process before they could participate in the activities in the community. So there were reasons why Peter and John might have kept the shroud secret because it would have been, you know, they didn't want Jesus to be recognized as being resurrected. And if they had this kind of proof that Jesus' body had was not inside of the shroud anymore and there was this miraculous image there was a fear it would be destroyed. So that's part of the thinking about why the shroud isn't mentioned in written documents in the scriptures. There is one place where uh, Paul is writing to the Galatians in Galatians 3.1, and he says, You foolish Galatians, you have seen Christ crucified before your very eyes. And so researchers think that Paul is referring to that they have seen the shroud. Mm. And there's other things like that that people are starting to look at with fresh eyes to try to understand, could this have been referring to the shroud? But not explicitly. So, okay, so what happened after Peter and John had it? So a lot of people think that they gave it to, the, to Jesus' mother, Mary, and Mary was entrusted into the care of John the Apostle John, and they went to Ephesus in Turkey. So there is some thought that Mary had it in her possession in Ephesus until her death or her assumption. That's a theory. So I don't know if that's true or not, but some people think that. So there's a legend that has persisted for a long time that there was a king in Edessa. And Edessa is a city in, in modern-day Turkey, near modern-day Urfa, Turkey. And this king, Abgar, had heard about Jesus, and he wanted Jesus to come and visit him because Abgar had leprosy. And so he wrote a letter and asked Jesus to come to him and to cure him of this leprosy. And the legend says that Jesus said, I can't come myself because I've got other plans, but I can send you something. And the legend says that the apostle Jude Thaddeus took the shroud with him and traveled to Edessa, Turkey, and that this king, Abgar, was healed of his leprosy, and that whole area became Christian. Mm -hmm. And history shows that that is the first area that became widely Christianized, is where this Edessa, now modern-day Urfa, Turkey, was. So that's the legend. Within two generations of King Abgar's death, that whole area had been, became pagan again. And so the thought is that the shroud was, was folded up and stored in a, a scroll jar. You know, those jars that uh, scrolls were kept in? Mm -hmm. Dead Sea Scrolls. Yes, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then hidden away in a wall in the city of Edessa. So they had a big gate, and over the gate, they, the thought is that the shroud was put into that niche above the gate and stored there. And the memory of this was lost. And it wasn't until there was an earthquake and a flood, and the city gate was needed to be repaired. And they discovered this shroud hidden in the walls. Now the reason why they think this is what happened is because I believe this earthquake and flood were in around 555. 
somewhere in that neighborhood. And there are images of Jesus that start to become common after this time period. And there's this school that grew up around Edessa of, of worship, and monks started going there, and they started developing the icons of what we all know what Jesus looks like today. And there's some of these images also <coughs> in this book of these icons. The, the One of the most famous ones is the Christ Pantocrator that's at, um, it's in the church, St. Catherine's um, on Mount Sinai. I think it's on page 22. This image of Jesus that we all, now today we all recognize, oh, that's Jesus. And it has all of these similarities to the face of the man of the shroud. And these have all been documented. So, like, we know that the man of the shroud has a swollen cheekbone. And so one eye in this Christ Pantocrator, his eye is swollen and his eyebrow is lifted. And a lot of the icons have this, like, triangle shape between the nose that, and that, that long, thin nose, the beard. All of these features start to become common on the icons that are depicting Jesus after this earthquake and flood and rediscovery of this image. And so before this time, Jesus was depicted as a young Greek boy. Uh, a lot of the images like in the catacombs, Jesus is depicted as clean shaven, short hair, young, very young. And after this time period, this becomes standard. This becomes the image of what we know as Jesus' appearance. Again, this is a theory about where the shroud was. But after this, this image was discovered, it became known as the image of Edessa. And it was well known that there was this image in Edessa that depicted what Jesus looked like. Now, that image was there it wasn't considered a full body image, so it was thought that it was folded up, so just only the face was visible. And there's another image that is also from that same time period, and it has a different name. It's called the Mandelion, M-A-N-D-Y-L-I-O-N. And neither of these images still exist today. And so researchers don't know, were there two images? Was there the image of Edessa and the Mandelian? Were they the same image, but they had two different names? And were they really the shroud, but folded up so that only the face was evident? So this is a mystery of the shroud. Some people will say for sure the image of Edessa was the shroud. It just was folded up so that only the face was evident. So I don't know. It's, it's not clear yet. So, there was this image in Edessa, and it was thought to have these powers to protect the city of Edessa. And the king, who was then in, in Constantinople, that was sort of the center of the world, then he wanted that image. And he traded 200 prisoners of war and he marched his entire army from Constantinople to Edessa, surrounded the city with his army, and said he wasn't leaving until he got this image of Edessa. And so that happened in 944. And so that image of Edessa was transferred from Edessa to Constantinople. And this is all documented that this happened. But whether the image of Edessa is the shroud is the question. But the image of Edessa went from Edessa to Constantinople in 944. So from 944 to 1204, this image was put on display. People saw it. It was listed in the inventory of the king's possessions. But it's not clear if it was definitely the shroud. So this is something that historians are actively working on to try to look through inventories, read letters, look at documentation to see if there's evidence that this face of Edessa was really a full-size body cloth showing the markings of crucifixion. 
So from 944 to 1204, image of Edessa is in Constantinople. Then in 1204 was the Fourth Crusade. And the Fourth Crusade was supposed to be to liberate the Holy Land from the infidels. But they, the Crusaders got waylaid in, outside of Constantinople and they got frustrated and they, they laid siege to the city of Constantinople. And this is one of the terrible things in the history of Christianity. The Christians ransacked Constantinople, a fellow Christian city. And the, the Crusaders, the Venetians mostly, they took the gold and the silver. And the French, they took all of the relics, the, the Christian icons, the relics of the saints. And that's how the crown of thorns ended up at Notre Dame in France. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the terrible things in the history of Christendom. And the Pope, when he heard about this, he was very upset about it. And he said, anybody who took relics from our brothers in Constantinople, either they need to return those relics to where they belong, or they will be excommunicated. So anybody who had a relic that was stolen from Constantinople didn't admit it. Okay, so this is in 1204. Mm -hmm. So one of the famous crusaders from 1204 was a man named Othon de la Roche. And Othon de la Roche was given the governorship of Athens. So he went from being a crusader in Constantinople to becoming the governor of Athens. And he wasn't even Greek. <laughs> no, and he wasn't even Greek. So guess who is a descendant of Othon de la Roche? Jean de Verge. So there's 500 or there's 140 something years of the missing years from Jean de Verge showing the shroud in Lyre, France to the sack of Constantinople from 1204 to 1355. We have a period of, well, depending on when you count the shroud showing up in history, somewhere around 100 to 150 years of missing years. And so historians think that it was the descendants of Othon de la Roche had the shroud, but they couldn't admit it because they would have been excommunicated. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until it was put on display in Lyre, France, that it became documented as being owned by that family. Lydia. Um, the famous crusader became the what of Athens? He became like the, the governor, okay. the leader of Athens. Okay. I have a question. Yes. You mentioned the crown of thorns being in France. How did that fit? I mean, <laughs> what's the story behind it? I don't know. I heard of that just now in your. Oh, well, it's so famous that the crown of thorns is at Notre Dame is in that Paris. Paris. I didn't they know. take it out? No, I didn't know. That. Yeah, yeah, but um, I don't. I, this is like what I know about. <laughs> okay. okay, that's true. Uh, yeah, no, I would think that would be interesting. I, it's probably a similar story that mm -hmm. it was stolen mm -hmm. um, during the Crusade. So this guy was a uh, he was the uncle of Jane of Virgin. No, he was several generations okay. before because it was over a hundred years. Okay. She's a direct descendant of him now. I can't remember like a great granddaughter or something like that. Sure. And so I gave you these theories about where the shroud was before 1355. And then we talked about the, uh, the descendants of Othon de la Roche ended up owning the shroud for the first time in recorded history, 1355. And then from there, we have a really good record of where the shroud was for the next, until modern times. The, the Savoy family was the ruling family of the northern part of Italy and the southern part of France. And they had castles all over that area and they would travel around from their castles and when they would travel, they took the shroud with them. For about 50 years, they traveled with the shroud. And they used the shroud as what's called a dynastic symbol. So it showed that they were, have, they were given the right to reign by God that they had this miraculous image in their possession. And so this was really important for them 
to show that they had God's approval for their leadership of this area. So they built a chapel to house the shroud in Chambéry, France. So Chambéry is near Lille, and Chambéry is where that terrible fire happened that I mentioned. So this is not very clear, but Lille is up here, and then just south of there is Chambéry. And that is where the shroud was housed in 1532 when the chapel caught on fire and there was that terrible fire and luckily the shroud was rescued. But I have this image up here to show you. We talked about the repeating burn holes and then these marks here, these are scorches from that fire that go down the side of the shroud. And some image was lost because the shoulder area of the image area was lost in the fire. But miraculously, the face image was not lost. It was preserved. And I say miraculously because when I looked up the, the temperature for how hot a fire has to be to melt silver, the temperature is 1,763 degrees Fahrenheit to melt silver. How much so, 1,763 degrees Fahrenheit to melt, melt silver. So for a fire to be that hot that the silver reliquary melted and molten silver dropped down on the shroud and burnt all the way through the fabric, but yet that most of the image was not destroyed. That seems a little miraculous to me. <laughs> so after the fire, the nuns who were there at, in Chambéry, the order was the Poor Claire nuns, they sewed the patches on the shroud and you can see the patches in this image. So these triangular shaped patches. And then they also sewed a backing cloth on the shroud and it was known as the Holland cloth and that's because it was produced in Holland. And so that cloth was sewn on the back of the shroud in 1534. So the, the back of the shroud wasn't seen for over five, well, for almost 500 years. So in 1578, the Savoys decided to make their capital in the city of Turin. And so they built the cathedral there, which is the cathedral of St. John the Baptist. And then they built their palace, which is there to this day. And in between, so this is the cathedral here, and this back here is the palace. And in between, they built this chapel. And the name of that chapel is the Guarini Chapel. And that is where they housed the shroud. And so the Guarini Chapel was built for the purpose of housing the shroud. So you can see the symbolism that they have this dynastic symbol in between the cathedral in the front and the palace in the back. They have the chapel in the middle with the, the shroud housed in between. And the Savoy family would bring out the shroud periodically and put it on display. So anytime there was a big celebration, a wedding or a baptism or a funeral, they would bring the shroud out and put it on display. One fact that you all might be interested in is that they used the excuse of a visit from St. Charles Borromeo as the rationale for moving the shroud from Chambéry to Turin. So Charles Borromeo had made a vow that if the city of Milan was spared from the plague, that he would make a pilgrimage barefoot to go visit the shroud. And so the Savoy family moved the shroud over the Alps so that it would be closer for Charles Borromeo so that he didn't have to go so far. And he actually made two pilgrimages to go see the shroud. There are some pictures in here that show some of the times when the shroud was put on display. And you can see all the bishops standing on the platform holding the shroud as it's on display for these events. So in 1578, that's when the shroud was moved to Turin, and it's been there ever since. The only time it's left to Turin was during World War II, and it was hidden away during World War II to protect it from the Nazis. Mm -hmm. But other than that, the shroud has been in Turin all of, all of these years. And it was also in private ownership of the Savoys up until 1983. So we'll talk more about that also. 
But that all, all, often surprises people that the shroud was in private ownership all those years. The next most significant thing that happened was in 1898, the Savoy family was celebrating the uh, 400 years since the cathedral had been built in Turin. And so they had a big celebration. And so they decided to put the shroud on display and let pilgrims come to see it. And photography was a new invention. It had been sort of um, popularized 40 years before. And so there was this amateur photographer whose name was Secunda Pia. So Secundo, S-E-C-U-N-D-O, Pia, Pia, P-I-A. And he was an amateur photographer. He was a, a lawyer by profession. And he was given the opportunity to come in and photograph the shroud. So this is the picture of him with his his big giant camera and he came in and he set up scaffolding so that he could be on the same level as the shroud because it was displayed up high and back then they had the big glass plates for the image to be um, exposed onto this glass plate and then he took it back to his dark room and put it in the developing solution and so as he was doing that of course this is the image that appeared in his developing solution. And in Secundapia's memoirs, he says he nearly dropped the glass plate yeah. because he realized that he was seeing the face of Jesus for the first time in almost 2,000 years. So this is the, this is what his, his black and white original looks like. So that is uh, when he just took the original and then this, of course, is the photographic negative. So, of course, he was amazed when he saw this. And he recognized that the photographic negative had the properties of the natural image. So, the original image, so I'm going to move on and show you. So, this is what it looks like to the naked eye the sepia tone blend, and then the black and white image is what the photographic negative looks like. Now, a lot of people are amazed by this because most people think that that photo negative is what the shroud looks like, mm -hmm. but it's the photographic negative image. So, what Secundapia discovered is that the shroud itself acts like a photographic negative. So when you have a photographic negative and a photographic negative, you get the positive image. So once the positive, the photographic negative image was revealed as having positive characteristics, people were fascinated because there's no other image that acts this way. And this really inaugurated the, the modern scientific study of the shroud. So this was in 1898. What did the lines across at the top and the bottom represent? So that was a fold. So there's like a crease in the fabric. And you know, when I got to go in July and see it myself, I just couldn't take my eyes off of that crease. Like you can actually see that the fabric is sort of like, you know when you crease fabric together? It's like you could see it, that there was fabric down in there. It's like this, like a fold in the fabric. I was so surprised by that. The, the later photographs, it's more smoothed out. But in the early photographs, it's very obvious. But that's what it's from. It's from like a crease in the fabric. Lydia and then Rob. OK. Um, so in 1898, the Savoy family was celebrating how many years? Yeah. I think it was 400. OK. They, I, they moved in. Is it three? They moved in 1578 to Turin. And then in 15, 9, 1898. That's 300 years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why do I have 400? Thank you for capturing your views. Yeah, years. yeah. <laughs> of being in where? Turin. In Turin. Turin. Okay. Yeah. So they built the cathedral and then they moved the shop there. Yeah. So the guy can cross the mountain. Yeah, it could have taken a, a very long time. So maybe yeah. they were serving the not the actual shroud being. Uh, the, 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 
400 from? I don't know. I'm going to have to double check that. Thank you for checking my math for me. And did you have a? Yeah, the the original shroud. I don't know, somewhere I've heard this like so it's on display for 10 days out of every 10 years or something like that. It's not out there that you can go to Turin and see it. That's right? correct. So it's it's not very often. So it was put on display in 1898. It wasn't put on display again until 1931. Oh. And so it's it's been on display more recently. It was on display in 2015, 2010, and I can't remember before that, but it's because there were so many popes during that time. It's hoped that it will be put on display again in 2025. So maybe that will happen. But it's not on display very often. The last time it was put on display was 2015, and it was on display over 60 days. And it was hung vertically, and it caught, it damaged the shroud because it shouldn't have been unsupported for that long. So they'll probably never display it that way again. They're going to display it flat from now on. So I, some of you know I got to go in July and see the shroud, which was because of this copy that we're getting here. It was just a tremendous privilege of my life. But when I got to go see it, they had built like a ramp. And so you came up on the ramp and there was glass, but then you looked down on the shroud. Yeah. And I think that's how they're going to display it in the future. And so they can open that glass, but you still are looking down on it, which is kind of nice because you can see it. It's really easier to see it looking down on it. And that way it doesn't have the stress on the fabric from hanging. Were you the one, was it because of you that we the museum was able to get a hold of that video of when the last time that it was displayed? There's a video of it. Oh, really? Oh, that was, um, was that during COVID? Yeah. That was televised. Yeah. yeah. The, it was a televised oh, viewing. Yeah. To pray for a deliverance from COVID. There's a copy of that on the internet or something? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I could find it. Yeah. But I know we have it. I do let them know. <laughs> I think it might even be on the website. We'll have to ask Genevieve because okay. she's the one that had it. Okay, so this is the thing I have the hardest time explaining is about the photographic negative, especially if you have young kids because they have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, I mean, people our age, we are used to photographic negatives. When they had the display at the Museum of the Bible, they had a selfie station. And so when you went to the selfie station, your selfie was a photographic negative. And so this is my selfie. And so that kind of helps to illustrate it, that the, the lights and the darks are reversed. But it's a hard concept to explain to somebody who's never heard of a photographic negative before. <laughs> but the idea is that the lights and the darks are reversed in the image area. However, the blood performs exactly as you would expect. So in the photographic negative, the blood is light because in the natural image, it's dark. So good luck explaining this. I find it very <laughs> challenging. That happened in 1898, and as I said, the next time the shroud was put on display wasn't until 1931. And it was photographed that year by a professional photographer. And in his memoir, Secunda Pia, the original photographer, said he was the most relieved person in the world when Henri's photograph turned out to be the same as his, because he was accused of fraud when he showed his photographic negative and it turned out with all these realistic features people said he must have done something to manipulate it and so when on re-photographed it in 1931 and have the same result then he was sort of vindicated so as i said this pho photography started out the modern era of scientific research so this doctor named pierre barbet so he's a frenchman b-a-r-b-e-t he started doing studies on cadavers. And the reason why he did that was because he wanted to understand crucifixion. And crucifixion had been outlawed during the time of Constantine. So since the fourth century, people were not crucified. So people didn't really know what the mechanism was for crucifixion. 
And as we know, in all the paintings in the Middle Ages, the Jesus on the cross is nailed through the palms of his hands. Mm -hmm. And so Pierre Barbet wanted to understand, well, how, how is somebody really crucified? So he started crucifying cadavers. And what he discovered is that a nail through the palm of the hand could not support the weight of a human body. It would just rip out. And sometimes it even would take the hand off of the cadaver. And so what he discovered is that there's this area, so if you put your thumb and your pinky finger together, there's this, uh, below the base of the thumb, there's kind of like a hole there. And if the nail goes in that area in your wrist, it will come out on the back side in the wrist area, and it, the bones of the hand or the wrist will open up and that nail will drive through and then the bones will close back together and it will be strong enough to support the weight of the human body. And this was really significant because the blood stains on the shroud are on the wrist area. And this is something where skeptics have said, well then this can't be the shroud of Jesus because when uh, Jesus appeared to the apostles and Doubting Thomas was there and he said, probe my hands and feel the wounds of my hands. And also, again in Isaiah, it's the prophecy is I have carved you on the palm of my hand. But the word for hand in Hebrew includes the wrist area all the way up to the forearm. So even though we have a different word for palm and wrist, in Hebrew it's the same word. So there really isn't a conflict with what the scriptures say. You can see this is the three-dimensional intensified image, but you can see that blood stain is much more in the wrist area and not in the palm area. Yeah. So um, Pierre Barbet was one of the first scientists, and then he, he started doing his research in the 30s, but he published his research in the, in the 50s. And he wrote this book, A uh, Doctor at Calvary. And he started talking about the physiological <coughs> uh, aspects of crucifixion. And he was the first one who said that the image of the man of the shroud is anatomically perfect from his forensic studies. The other person who was prominent during this time is this Swiss criminologist by the name of Max Fry. And he became prominent because he was one of the first forensic scientists, so he would go to crime scenes and collect up information from the crime scenes. And he pioneered this, the use of sticky tape. And I'm always horrified by this picture. I mean, that just looks like a roll of scotch tape that he, he took and he put it down on the shroud and lifted it off. And he got all of these slides of these sticky tape samples. Now, in the exhibit here, we're going to have what was used in 1978 for their sticky tape samples, but they use, it's called a torque applicator, and they designed this special instrument so that they would use a consistent amount of pressure. They wouldn't overpress so that they wouldn't damage the fabric of the shroud. So that's going to be one of the pieces in our exhibit is this torque applicator. But before that, in the early 70s, Max Fry brought his roll of scotch tape and put it right down on the shroud and lifted off these um, sticky tape samples. And he gathered a lot of information from that. So on those sticky tape samples, there was dust and pollen. Now, there is a lot of controversy about the pollen samples in particular. And this book has some information on the pollen. I usually don't cover it in my presentations because it is controversial. But on page 20, there is some explanation about the pollen. The reason why I say it's controversial is because Max Fry died before he finished his summary of his findings. And so it's, it wasn't ever finished. There have been other botanists who have looked at his samples and drawn conclusions from them. And so that's what's re reflected here in this book. I'm trying to see the numbers of how many different pollens. 58 genre or species, mostly from plants growing in the Near East. So some people say that they can use the pollen 
to track the trail of the shroud, that there are pollens that are from plants that only grow in the area of Palestine. And then of course there's a lot of pollen from France and Italy, from Europe, but there's pollens on there from India and from Egypt and then also from the area of Palestine. And I'm just hedging a little bit about that because this is an area that is still being researched. And so it's an area that needs more study. But it, you could see it could be a very fruitful area for telling the history of the shroud, where it has been exposed to air over its lifespan. But these are the kind of things that people are gonna ask about, I think, because people have heard about the pollen samples and the pollen studies, and it's really interesting, but unfortunately, it's also a little bit controversial. It's like the coins on the ice. Like some people say it's definitely this way, and other people say it's definitely this other way, and the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. So I'm always just a little careful about being definitive about it. There is pollen on the shroud. It's been determined that it's from the areas that I mentioned. Europe, Palestine, India, that's very interesting. Some people think the shroud might have been manufactured in India, and that's why there's so much pollen from India. Sure. I had one quick question. I had heard recently that they were vacuuming the shroud or cleaning it, is that true? Yes, and they preserved everything that they vacuumed. So there is a lot of information that can be studied more. It just, it's an evolving science, yeah. studying these things. That was kind of hurtful to hear. <laughs> That's part of the history that I'll talk about. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right, so that was Max Fry. He's pretty important in the history of the shroud. Then the next thing, we've already talked about this, uh, the three-dimensional characteristics of the shroud. So, John Jackson is a big name. He was the founder of the Shroud of Turin Research Project. And so they formed this team after John Jackson and Eric Jumper put the shroud photo into that VPA image analyzer and recognized that there were characteristics of three-dimensionality encoded on a piece of linen fabric that was centuries old. So this literally blew their minds. And so they wanted the opportunity to study it more. And that's when they put together the Shroud of Turin Research Project. So we talked about how there's clock to body distance encoded in the fabric. So the STIRP team was formed in 1978. And I have on here 26 plus international scientists. And the reason why I put the plus on there is because not all the scientists went to Turin. 26 went to Turin. They took 80 cases of uh, equipment with them, scientific equipment for the study. And they were given 120 hours, so five days, day and night, of uninterrupted access to do whatever studies they wanted to do on the shroud as long as they didn't damage it in any way. So Rudy Dictel, who is our expert who has donated his stuff to our our collection here. He will be here on for the grand opening in April. And also Barry Schwartz, who was the documenting photographer for the CERT team. They will both be here for the grand opening. And then on April 27th, we're having the evening with the experts. And it's going to be at the Centrum. And that's we're going to have Rudy and Barry sit down and talk about their experiences of being on the CERT team. So there's very few people in the world who handled the shroud. And they will they are two of the ones who have, and they'll be here to talk about their experiences. So this is um, a picture of the table that they manufactured, this uh, steel table that was part of the 80 crates of items that they shipped over. And they thought of everything when they were planning for their scientific study. And they were worried that when the, the steel table was being transported from the US over to Italy, that there could be some organisms that would grow on the table that could interact with the shroud and potentially damage the shroud. And sure enough, when they unpacked the table, it had like a white coating on it. But they were prepared, and they had mylar that had been donated to the STIRP team from NASA. 
And so they covered the steel table with the mylar because it's inert and it wouldn't uh, interact with the shroud fabric. And so when we were unpacking the boxes that Rudy sent of his donation, there was a piece of this mylar that was folded up in one of the boxes. Wow. And so that's going to be in our exhibit here. So, and that's a nice connection for Houston that it was um, donated by NASA. So it's the same mylar like you see in the space program. The reason why I included this slide is this is the list of the scientists who went to Turin. And I know you can't read it because it's too little, but it tells where they're from. And so a lot of times the skeptics say, oh, the Sturt team was made up of a bunch of religious fanatics. Mm -hmm. And that is not true. These were scientists and they had one objective. They wanted to understand how this image was made because there's no other image that exists that has photo negativity aspects and contains three dimensional information. So these were scientists from NASA, JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, Sandia, IBM. They were physicists from the Air Force Academy, University of Colorado. So they were very well-known scientists and they came from all kinds of religious backgrounds. There were some Catholics and Protestants and Jews and agnostics and, and I think even some atheists. So it was not a religious team at all. It says their objective was just to understand yeah, determine how the image was formed. So um, they did all of these different kinds of tests that all of these, a lot of photography. So they photographed the shroud using infrared light, using ultraviolet light, using fluorescent spectrometry and radiography. I don't think you need to know these tests because this is, this is super science. But they did legitimate scientific testing. They took their findings home and they studied them and they wrote peer-reviewed journal articles that were published in 1981. 20 different peer-reviewed scientific journal articles were published. So this was legitimate science looking at all of these different studies that they took. Can you tell them? That fun fact that I thought was really cool about how we almost didn't get their equipment into the country. Yeah. Yes, and I'm hoping they'll tell that story on the night. But there, one of the pieces of equipment was uh, had a radioactive. I think it was maybe the X-ray equipment had a radioactive symbol on it. You know, the skull and crossbones thing. So it got hung up in the customs. Mm -hmm. And so they, the team had come early and they were already, they were going to set everything up and test it and they, they didn't get their equipment released to them until just the last minute. And actually Barry has some photographs of them bringing the shroud in and you can see the steel table in the background and it's not completely covered with the mylar yet. They were not quite ready. Some other funny stories, I, I'm sure he'll tell these, but they went out and bought white gloves for the scientists to wear so that they wouldn't contaminate the shroud in any way. But unfortunately, those white gloves left behind traces of cotton on the shroud. But not only that, when they brought the shroud in, it had been on display and all the pilgrims had come to see it. So when they brought it in, they had used thumbtacks and they had thumbtacked the shroud to a backing board, like a piece of plywood black backing board. So when they took the thumbtacks out, there were areas of rust underneath the thumbtacks because it had been thumbtacked up there for so long. So it's like the scientists went to all of this trouble to treat it literally with white gloves and then it hadn't been taken care of that carefully well, before. Was there any damage done by just natural light? Well, that they don't store it in natural light anymore because it's been exposed over the years to candles and incense and all the stuff in the churches and there, you know, when I was in Italy in July and I met with Enrico, who is the custodian of the shroud now, he says they are anticipating in 90 to 100 years, you won't be able to see the image anymore. Mm -hmm. The light damage is the yeah. one that type of damage you can never restore. And the image will still be there. Because remember, it's a chemical change in the fabric. So the image will still be there, but the background fabric will be aging. 
and it will catch up. So that 15% differential between the image area and the non-image area will yeah. start to cancel out. Could they not put it like in nitrogen gas or near gas? To it is in, in, it's in argon gas. Argon. So back to STIRP. So they published their findings in 1981, and I think this will be in the exhibit, this conclusion, that they, can, they said we can conclude for now that it's a real human form of a scourge crucified man, not the product of an artist. And they say in another place that there's no paint, no brush strokes, no directionality, there's no pigment of any kind on the shroud, so it is not the work of an artist. And it has blood stains composed of hemoglobin that give a positive test for serum albumin, but it's an ongoing mystery. And until further tests are studied, the problem remains unsolved. The problem of how the image was formed. Yeah, this is very dramatic conclusion from these scientists. Okay. So this is a picture of King Umberto. This was a year before he died. So he was deposed in, in World War II. So he was in, living in exile in Portugal. And he, uh, this is a year before he died, he met with Pope Francis and he left the shroud in his will to the person of the Pope. And so the current owner of the, of the shroud is Pope Francis. And um, who is he again? This was the last king, the House of Savoy, King Umberto. Okay. And this is where the shroud is today. It's still in that cathedral. It's in the side chapel. And when you go there, you can see it in the side chapel. So the shroud is in there, and it's underneath the cover, and it's in its special case. Okay, we got to spend some time on the radiocarbon dating. Because if you have people come here and they've only ever heard one thing about the shroud, they will have heard that it was proved to be a fake in 1988 because of the radiocarbon dating. So after the shroud was gifted to Pope John Paul II, he agreed to let a piece of the shroud be cut to be radiocarbon dated. And this is, was very significant. And the American scientists who had been a part of the STIRP team, they came up with a protocol for how this radiocarbon dating should be carried out. They recommended that there be seven samples taken from various locations around the shroud so that they can make sure that all the different areas were represented. They also recommended that there be two different types of radiocarbon dating done because there was a new type of radiocarbon dating that had been developed. So they wanted to use the old type and the new type for the testing. But neither of those things happened. At the very last minute, the official came in and cut this strip right here. You can see this strip that was cut eight centimeters long. And that one single sample was what was used for the radiocarbon dating. So it was cut into four pieces. One piece was kept in reserve and then the, the other half was cut into three pieces. And they were, it was sent to three different laboratories, one in Zurich, one in um, Ox, Oxford, and then Arizona. So those were the three laboratories. And the whole process was overseen by the British Museum. So one single piece of fabric was cut and sent to three laboratories. And then, I don't know if you guys remember, but I remember very clearly when the results were reported in 1988. This, there was this press conference and the three different labs came and said the results of the radiocarbon dating show that it was, the fabric was produced in 1260, between 1260 and 1390. And there were headlines all over the world, Trav Turin is proven to be a fake. So obviously this was very devastating news in the Trav world. Before the radiocarbon dating, there had been over 20 international centers that were doing active research on the shroud. After the radiocarbon dating, the whole Trav world just went dark because people were devastated by this news. But as time went on, people started questioning this process of taking the single sample and specifically where the sample was chosen to be cut from. So you can see we talked about that the Savoy family put the shroud on display throughout history 
and the, the bishops and the family would line up and hold the shroud in the corners while it was on display. So the area that they chose is this area right here for um, cutting that little sample. And this is one of the photos of the shroud that was taken using the fluoroscopy. And what this shows is the area that was cut. This, so this is a photo from 1978, right here. The main body of the shroud is this yellow color under this fluorescent light. But this is a burn area right here, and it fluoresces red. But this area that was cut is forest green. So this shows, you can see it with your own eyes, that it's chemically different than the rest of the shroud. And that is the area that they chose to cut for their sample for the radiocarbon dating. Now, this is what I'm telling you, this is settled science, but it has never been reported the way that the radiocarbon dating saying it was a fake was reported. That was reported around the world, headlines around the world. But the same, paper, the same journal that published those results was a magazine called Archaeometry, and it's a publication of Oxford University. And in 2019, they published a paper that said the statistical analysis of the raw data from the radiocarbon dating shows that it was a bad sample. And this is, it's definitive. I mean, it's not, if you go to any lecture on the shroud, they're going to spend half of their time talking about how, uh, trying to disprove the radiocarbon dating. But we don't have to, it's done. It's been refuted. So, when was that? 2019? 2019. Wow. It was published in Archaeometry. And uh, so this is the, you can look it up. <laughs> this researcher, Tristan Casabianca, he's a French uh, law student, and he used the Freedom of Information Act, and he petitioned the British Museum for the raw data from the radiocarbon studies. And what he found from this radiocarbon dating raw data was that there was a very big difference in the dates that as you moved through the fabric, there was over a 200 year difference in the dates that from fabric that was just a few centimeters apart. And it should be the same. It should be homogenous. But what he found is by looking at the raw data that the fabric was not homogenous. Now that's the only conclusion that he can draw from the raw data, that the fabric was not homogenous. Just in that little eight centimeter sample that was chosen. Explain again, that's so important, what non-homogenous means. So in a, in a piece of linen, you would expect anywhere that you would cut a sample, that the samples would all be the same, homogenous. But instead, when they cut one sample and they measured it at one end, they got one date, and when they measured it just a few centimeters away, they got a date over 200 years different. So it shows that that data was not homogenous. It was heterogeneous. Okay. So it wasn't consistent. So how did that happen? Good question. Okay, so we'll go back. Because this is really important, and this is probably the biggest question you're gonna get, because I'm telling you, any skeptic in the world is gonna say, what about the radiocarbon dating? It doesn't matter how heaped up the samples are about all these other tests that have done that have showed that it's authentic. This one test that's been completely refuted still is primary in people's mind. What the theory is, why this happened, to answer your question, is that this area where the sample was taken, so you can see on your your little handout here. So you can see oh, if oh, you, both corners. Yeah, both corners. This is the area where the radiocarbon sample was taken right here. And it's an area that was known to have been repaired in the history of the shroud. It's also in this area, I don't know if you can see by it. the lens because of the fire? Mm -hmm. Well, when you look at the patches that were done by the nuns, they were very crudely done. These repairs were almost invisible. And the theory, and again, this is a theory, and there are people that disagree with this, but the theory is that when the shroud was in the court of the French nobility, that there were experts 
in the household who could do invisible reweaving because their houses were full of tapestries and carpets and things that needed to be repaired. And there's a technique that's known as French invisible reweaving. Mm -hmm. And so this is the theory, is that one piece of fabric is on one side and the other piece of fabric on the other side and they unravel a little bit of it and then splice the individual threads together mm -hmm. and weave it back together so that it's invisible to the naked eye. So there is evidence that this could have happened in this area of the shroud. So if that's the case, then there would be cotton fibers in the sample that was radiocarbon dated, and those cotton fibers would be new, newer than the ancient linen. And so that accounts for the date, the more modern date. Again, this is a theory about how that could have happened. This is an area that needs further study um, to, for, for the dating. But the problem with radiocarbon dating is it requires that a piece be cut and then it be destroyed. And so it seems unlikely that the Pope would agree yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah. And because this was so devastating to really to the church that uh, it was a medieval fake. And so I don't know if it'll ever be dated like that again. There are other ways of dating things that are being developed. And so maybe in the future there will be a better method of dating fabrics. I've, I've always wondered, and it's a question that might come up, uh, that there are so many relics, you know, and every time they open a church they have to have a relic or the altar. And who verifies this stuff? I mean, because you could say anything back then. Yeah. Well, and that that gave the church a bad name. I mean, that's why the Reformation happened, because of the of just those kind of problems. The church now doesn't call the shroud a relic. They call it an icon. So an image, an image of Christ. So it so can't be proven. Yeah. Oh. Right. Okay. Yeah. So icon is. Uh, the current term. And I mean, they used to have like fingers and nothing. Oh, they still do. All kind of yeah. Stuff. And yeah. It, with the technology they have today, it would be interesting how much of that is just. Yeah, like the true wood of the cross, and yeah. like we were saying, the crown of thorns of Notre Dame. And I, I imagine you will get questions about this, though. So I hope I've given you enough information. This is definitive. Yeah. Yeah. This paper, I have a quote here from it. It says, it is not possible to affirm that the 1988 radiocarbon dating offers conclusive evidence. So the radiocarbon dating from 1988 can be thrown out because it has been shown it was not a good sample. What motivated this? Well, because people trying to understand how did these results come out the way that they did. Mm -hmm. and. So that's why they asked for the actual raw data, so that it could be analyzed statistically. And what is the word archaeometry? That's the name of the journal. What does it mean? It's, the, it's a journal. It's published by Oxford University, and it's for people that are in the archaeological sciences. So, so the word itself doesn't mean anything. It's just, it's it's just the name of the journal. Okay, yeah. 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 This book that I have in here, <laughs> This book is 800 pages long that's wrapped up in the shroud. And um, it actually, that might not be the right one. He's written another book since then. It's 800 pages that talks about the radio carbon dating mm -hmm. and all the things that went wrong with it. Mm -hmm. So, and why they didn't go with the original seven samples. And There's a lot of theories about that, and they aren't good. I mean, it's like, bad people were doing bad things. I mean, the church requested the seven samples? That's what that the scientists happened. recommended. That's what the scientists mm -hmm. okay. And But that's not what happened. That's not what they did. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they did not do as many samples as they were supposed to on each piece that they got. And two times right on At least two places to do this. Yeah. They only did the one type of radio carbon that do as many samples on the piece that they each got. And their samples were like a postage stamp size yeah. of what they were doing the studies on. So, yes. So the author's carrying on the thing, too. 
uh, of Christianity's most revered relic. Yeah. Not icon. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But the church does call it an icon. So that's me visiting the shroud in July. So that kind of shows you what, how you get, how you observe it now. Instead of it being hanging, it's more like you look at it looking down. And that's how it'll probably be displayed from now on. This is the table where it's stored. And it's inside of a, a box that's made from a solid piece of aluminum. It was milled out, the aluminum, because they didn't want to have anything that could possibly interact with the shroud. And then it's kept in a controlled environment. So the temperature's controlled. It's mostly argon gas, but there's a little tiny bit of oxygen put in the argon gas. And that's how it's stored. I just wanted to show you, in 20, 2002, the shroud was restored. Before 20, 2002, remember I told you that Holland clock had been sewn to the back. And the scientists were worried that there was, this Holland clock was causing possible damage to the shroud. They were worried that there was dust mites that were being trapped in between the layers of the fabric. And then the areas that had been singed in the fire, there was particles of um, like soot and ash that were in between the layers of the fabric and they were afraid it was causing damage. So they took off the backing cloth and they took off those patches and they vacuumed it, the whole shroud, and supposedly they kept everything that they vacuumed so it could be studied. And then they stretched it. So those two things, the vacuuming and the stretching, are very controversial because scientists are like, how are we gonna study this because the fold marks tell a lot of information about the history of the, the shroud, like how it was folded up, how it was stored at different times. And then the things they vacuumed up also tell information about it. So it was very controversial, this, this so restoration. Was the, was the backing cloth kept? I believe the backing cloth was kept. So, so that could be tested. Yeah. And a new backing clock was put on. So this is how it looked before, and this is how it looks today. So the new backing clock is a lighter color. So the old backing clock was darker, so there was more contrast. You could see the image a little better with the old backing clock. You can see today, it's kind of hard to see the image. It's gotten more faint. And then up here, this is circled where you can see where the little tiny piece that was taken right there, that's the only part that was used for the radiocarbon dating, just a little tiny piece. But that's what it looks like today. That's what our replica is gonna look like. You can see it's still beautiful. The, the linen fabric is still really beautiful, even though it's 2,000 years old. Perhaps it's gonna look like the top and the bottom. The top is the old one. And that's what the, the restoration's gonna look like, the one that we're getting here. The one that we're getting will look like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how it looks today. Now those triangles where the nuns patched it, those are still left bare or open? Or? They're not, they didn't patch them over. They're okay. open, yeah. At the very top of the image, there's a seam that goes all the way across the top. It's about a three inch piece of fabric at the very top, and then there's a seam that goes all the way across. Mm -hmm. Do you guys see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, people don't talk about this seam very much, but I think it's really interesting. So, remember I told you about the banding from when the fabric is manufactured, that there's different colors of bands that you can see in the weave? So, at some point in the history of the shroud, this top strip was cut off from the shroud, and then it was sewn back on, and it was sewn back on so intricately that those bands go all the way across. So it was sewn back exactly in the place where it had been removed. And nobody knows the answer to why was this piece cut off. So there's different theories about it. So one theory is that it was like before Jesus was wrapped in the cloth that somebody ripped it off and got like a, this three inch band and then that was used to loosely bind the shroud around the body. So that's one theory. So do you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, it was very carefully sewn back on. So 
That's one theory. What would be the purpose of that? Mm -hmm. Just to keep it intact, to keep it that. So the legs don't spread out or their arms flop or, you know. Yeah, and just to kind of secure the fabric down mm -hmm. on the body. That's, a lot of people think that. Another theory is that the fabric, when it was woven, was woven on a big loom, mm -hmm. so that there would have been as many as three sections of fabric. And so you can imagine if it was three times as wide, so nine feet wide, then if you cut one three-foot strip, then you'd have a three-foot middle strip, and then you'd have a three-foot strip over here. So on the ends would be finished ends, known as the selvage. Mm -hmm. But the middle would have no finished ends. Mm -hmm. It would be raggedy. Mm -hmm. So one theory is that the nice finished end was cut off over here and sewn on over here. So that this piece would be beautiful. It would have two nice finished ends, making it even more expensive. And then the other pieces would just be hemmed. They wouldn't have a selvage, they would have a hem. So, I don't know what's the answer. <laughs> but there is this side strip that's on there. So, the reason why I'm taking all this time to tell you about the side stitch, or side seam. That's when they took the carbon dating. They took the carbon dating from there. And they found in, what year was this, 2004, there were some excavations done in Masada. So Masada was the where the Jewish people went when Rome came and invaded Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in 70 AD. The, the holdouts went to Masada. And they, they stayed there, I think, until 72 AD. And they ended up dying there. And Masada has been being excavated, and they found these textiles there. And this is the only other place where this stitch has been found. So the stitch that was used to sew this side seam back onto the shroud, the only other place where that stitch has been found has been in these textiles from Masada mm -hmm. in 72, from 72 AD. So this is really significant in terms of dating the, the time of the shroud. So this is showing how that stitching was done. It's almost invisible. I mean, you can you look and you see it when you look at the picture, but unless you know it's there, you don't really notice it. The other thing is that the image is centered with the side strip on there. So I kind of lean toward the selvage idea because that would have made it a finer piece of fabric that it would have selvage on both sides. But we don't know the I answer think to that. it was used to find um you know, the cloth to the body, the, the, the density of that, um, of the image, it would be more dense where it was closer to the body, just like the nose mm -hmm. and the hands and that sort of thing. You don't mm -hmm. see evidence of No, there's no, shroud. yeah, that's true. So I don't know the answer to that, but it's one of the interesting features. Okay, so. So are you saying that this, this uh, side seam was there when the shroud fabric was purchased? It's unknown. It could have been, had no seam when it was purchased, and then before they wrapped Jesus' body in it, they cut off that section and used it to wrap around the body. I think I have a picture of that that I can try to find. That's so, one theory. So Joseph Laramathea bought the linen. Mm -hmm. How far was Masada from Arimathea? Uh, Masada is south, maybe 70 or 80 miles. Um, was it known for fine linens? Or? No, it's just where they went to, um, they could defend it. Masada, it was, Masada was a big mountain. Yeah. And it had a yeah. fort on the top. And they jumped off the side. The Jews went up there. They built a so ramp. I know. That's how they were eventually conquered, was the Romans built a ramp up the side. And, and then so they, they jumped off the ledge? They, they killed they themselves. They committed suicide. They did like, um, like the same they way that they would um, mm -hmm. butcher their kosher animals. Mm -hmm. They butchered themselves. They drew lots, and one person would kill the whole family and then kill themselves. That's yes. terrible. It's horrible. But... Um, so it's not known when the side strip was removed or when it was sewn back on. But it's known that the stitch was known in 72 AD when people were buried in Masada in a, in a shroud. 
Well, the last thing I think I really want to mention is that now there's this field of syndonology, which is the study of the linen. Syndon is the name in Latin for the shroud. So um, sometimes you'll hear syndon or syndone, and the translation for that is a large sheet. And sometimes they use the word syndon for sails, for the sails on their boats. So it implies a big piece of fabric. The other term you will hear is athonia, O-T-H-O-N-I-A. That's the Greek word, and it's a plural. So when we read John's Gospel, John talks about the linens, plural, lying there. So um, both words are used in the Gospel, syndone and athonia. So this term, syndonology, means people who study the shroud. And it's a whole field of research now. And these are the areas of ongoing scientific study. So where was the shroud before it came into history in written form in the 1350s? What about the pollen and dust? We talked about how it's unconfirmed, some of these things. More study is needed. I neglected to mention to you about the dust. So let me just mention that real fast. This is not controversial. There are high concentrations of dust on the nose, on the knee, and on the feet. And that dust has been compared chemically to the grottos around the gates of Jerusalem. And it has the same chemical fingerprint as the, the gates around Jerusalem. Travertine aragonite limestone. So um, that shows that the shroud at some point in its history was in this area of Jerusalem around the gates of, of the city. And next time we get together, we'll go through the passion of Jesus and talk about all of the wounds of Jesus. But on the shroud, the knees are very badly cut. And in the tradition of the Catholic Church, we have the Stations of the Cross on good, uh, throughout Lent, but uh, primarily on Good Friday. And we talk about Jesus falling three times. And so we haven't talked about it yet, but he did just carry the crossbeam, as you mentioned. And his hands would have been tied to the crossbeam. So when he fell, he would have had no way to break his fall. So he would have fallen to his knees and then fallen to his chest and fallen on his face. And so that's why it's believed that there's this travertine aragonite dust in the nose area, because he would have fallen on his face into the dirt. So that is not controversial. That dust has been proven to be from those sticky tape samples from those areas around Jerusalem. There's something else I didn't mention that I wanted to mention and now I've forgotten it. Let's see. We talked about syndonology. So the other area I used to say that one of the areas of study is understanding the radiocarbon dating, why it turned out the way it did. So there's still people trying to understand about the reweaving, if that really took place, or why was that sample so anomalous, not like the rest of the shroud. So that's an ongoing area of study. The blood, did I mention about the AB blood type? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that all old blood is AB easy. blood type, so there's more study needed for the blood. And then obviously the big one is how was the image formed? And that's where there's a lot of theories about how the image was formed. But I can tell you how it was not formed. It was not formed by paint because there's no paint, pigment, brush strokes, any of that. It wasn't formed by rubbing because there's areas that didn't touch the cloth that have image on them. It wasn't formed by photography because photography wasn't invented until the early 1800s. And what's the other one people say? Oh, like a natural process from a decaying body that maybe this is something that happened naturally. Well, there's no other shroud that has an image on it like this. So if there were other ones, then maybe we could consider that as a theory. Yes? I want to think. I, there's something, it's in Spain, I believe it is, that there was like a face cloth yes. mm -hmm. on him under the shroud. That how did his face get through that to the shroud? So the cloth was not on his face when he was buried. 
the scriptures say it was rolled up and um, it was separate from the linen cloth. What Rob is talking about is known as the Sudarium of Oviedo, and it's in a church in Oviedo, Spain, and it's been there since the seventh century. Somewhere in the mid, like 614 time frame, this cloth has been in the cathedral in Spain since then. And the purpose of this Sudarium, it means like handkerchief or sweat cloth, and so the thought is that when after Jesus died on the cross, that they put the cloth over his face to protect his loved ones from seeing how disfigured he was. Because there was fluid coming out of his nose, his ears, his mouth, um, fluid from his lungs, from his pleural cavity. So it would have been a very hideous sight. And so the sudarium was wrapped around his face to, to cover it and also to clean it up. And then it's believed it was kept on there until it was removed and then the shroud was put over him. Oh, okay. And the, the sudarium has been studied extensively, not as extensively as the shroud, but scientists have discovered that the stains on the sudarium, their blood stains and their fluid, like pleural edema from his lungs, that those stains exactly match the stains on the shroud. But there's no image on the sudarium. It's only blood and pleural oh, fluid. Okay. No image. Oh. And but it's an important thing for dating the shroud because they scientists have determined that the sudarium and the shroud covered the same face within minutes of each other. And so they know the provenance of the sudarium back to I think it's six fourteen, but I'm not don't quote me on that. So in that time frame. So they know the provenance all the way back to then. And so that tells us the shroud is at least that old. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got Gloria, and then I've got Jackie. I'm not I'm sure I'm, I'm understanding exactly the difference, but uh, in my reading of the Bible, it mentions that the face cloth was folded out on top of the shroud, or, or on the shroud, when the um, disciples walked into the burial spot. So are you saying that that cloth was put on and then taken off. Yes. That's what I thought I understood you to say. Yes. But before they found him in the uh, burial. Yes. So he was, it was put on his face, like in this picture, while he was still on the cross. Oh, oh then, while he was on the cross. Yes. Okay. And then he was taken down from the cross and the cloth was removed and then he was wrapped in the shroud. The face cloth was they removed. they have taken the face cloth with them and yes. they put the shroud around him? Yes, because this was post-mortem blood mm -hmm. and post-mortem fluid. Right. And for the Jewish belief, all of those things needed to be kept together with the body. Gotcha. Okay. So it would be buried in that makes the sense. same place okay. with the body. That clicked. Okay. Thank you. When was the shroud, um, when was Jesus placed in the shroud? Oh. When you go to Jerusalem, you see a cooling table where they say that Jesus was laid there so that he was prepared for burial before he's moved to the tomb. Mm -hmm. So at what point was he placed in the shroud? Well, his body is in rigor mortis. So rigor mortis usually starts within 30 minutes to an hour after death. So he was still in rigor mortis while, I mean, the rigor mortis came on while he was still on the cross because his, his knees are bent, his head is down. So when you see the body, um, let's see if I can find it. This is showing the shape of the body. It's not because he had a pillow under his head or something under his knees, it's because he was in rigor mortis. So somewhere between 30 minutes and an hour after he died, he, Joseph of Arimathea had to go and get permission to, to take the body. And the scriptures tell us they were in a rush because they needed to be finished by 6 p.m. because that was sundown and the beginning of the celebration of the Sabbath. <coughs> and so we know he was crucified somewhere between 9 and noon. He hung on the cross between noon and 3. And he had to be tucked away in the tomb before 6. So there's a three-hour period of time. So if he died at 3, it took an hour for Joseph of Arimathea to go to Pilate and get permission to take his body. Because typically, a victim of crucifixion 
They would be taken down from the cross and thrown into a pit. There would be no burial. And so for Joseph to go and get permission to take his body and to bury it, it took some time. And then the body was taken down, taken from the site of crucifixion to the tomb, and then probably wrapped in the shroud there. So in the time of Jesus, they had the tombs you would go down, like it would have a little vestibule, and you'd go down, and there would be a shelf, and they would put the body on the shelf, and then wrap it in the shroud. And then after a year, they would come back, and the body would be decayed, and they would collect the bones, and put the bones in an ossuary jar. And then the, the ossuary jar could be put on a shelf, so the whole family could be together in one tomb. So just one person at a time would be on the shelf decaying, but the whole family would be together in ossuaries in the wall, in the family tomb. But the scriptures tell us Joseph's tomb was brand new. Nobody had ever been laying in it before. So Jesus was the first one put on that shelf. And so probably that's where his body was wrapped. So this kind of depicts that shelf. <clears throat> Um, and this kind of also shows that side strip idea, mm -hmm. that this would be the side strip, mm -hmm. kind of going around the body and securing the, the shroud to the body. This was a lot of detail. You guys hung in there really well. I, I hope it wasn't overloaded. So interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you.